Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to introduce the parity operator in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The parity operator is the operator that describes a reflection about the origin. For example, when applied to a wave function, it reflects it from r to minus r. For this reason, it is also called the space inversion operator. The parity operator is extremely useful, particularly in problems with inversion symmetry, in which reflecting the system about the origin doesn't change its state. Such problems include simple examples, such as the infinite square well, or more interesting cases, such as the quantum harmonic oscillator or the hydrogen atom. To make it even more exciting, the interactions between fundamental particles, such as the electromagnetic interaction or the strong nuclear force, are symmetric under parity. The only exception is the weak nuclear force, which does break parity. So, to become familiar with this topic, today we'll define the parity operator and explore how it acts on quantum states. There is a companion video in which we explore the interplay between the parity operator and other operators, and I also recommend you check it out to complete your understanding of the parity operator. Let's go! The easiest way to define the parity operator is by considering its action on position eigenstates. Remember that the position eigenstates are defined via the eigenvalue equation of the position operator. Although I'm using the same labels for operators and their eigenvalues and eigenstates, which can be very convenient, we have to be very clear about what each symbol represents. So to make sure that we understand every symbol in this expression, let's start with r hat. It is the position operator. The next symbol, the vector r, is the position eigenvalue, and the ket r is the position eigenstate associated with the eigenvalue r. So we need to make sure that we don't mix this up. We're now ready to define the parity operator. We label it with the symbol pi hat, and define it by its action on the position eigenstates, by setting this equal to the eigenstate minus r. As simple as this. Now, to understand what the parity operator is doing, let's draw a set of Cartesian coordinate axes. If the vector r here is the position eigenvalue of state r, then the application of the parity operator generates a new state minus r, whose eigenvalue is the vector minus r obtained by a reflection about the origin of coordinates. For this reason, the parity operator can also be called the space inversion operator. With this definition, it is very important that we don't confuse the ket minus r with the negative of the ket r. The first is the eigenstate of the position operator associated with the position eigenvalue minus r. For the second, this part here is the eigenstate of the position operator associated with the eigenvalue r, and all we're doing is multiplying the ket by the scalar minus 1 here. This is a subtle but essential difference to be able to confidently work with the parity operator, so make sure you're happy with it. The definition of the parity operator by its action on the position eigenstates up here allows us to then deduce its action on arbitrary states. All we need to do is to expand the state of interest in the basis of the position eigenstates, and then we can act with the parity operator on those. As an example, to start with, Let's consider the action of the parity operator on a momentum eigenstate p. From the video on wave functions, which you can find linked in the description, we know how to expand this momentum eigenstate in the position basis. The expansion is given by a Fourier transform. We can now move the parity operator inside the integral, and doing so, we get this expression here. This is now the action of pi on the position eigenstate, so we get this. It is now convenient to change variables to r prime equal to minus r. With this change, the integral becomes this. Two things to note here. First, I have conveniently rearranged the exponent so that the minus sign comes up with the p here. And second, we should in principle have d minus r prime here, but as the integral is over all space, then the integral over d minus r prime is in fact equal to the integral over d r prime, and I've just directly written the r prime. This expression is now simply the Fourier transform of the state with momentum minus p, so we can write it as the ket minus p. What this all means is that the action of the parity operator on a momentum eigenstate gives another momentum eigenstate with an eigenvalue reflected about the origin. This strategy is general. 
To figure out the action of the parity operator on a general state, we first need to write out the state in the position basis, and then we can act with the parity operator on the individual position item states, as we just did in this example. The reason I use this example to start with is because it shows that the parity operator acts on both position and momentum eigenstates in the same way. We simply reflect both quantities about the origin. Let's recap. We've defined the parity operator by its action on the eigenstates of the position operator, as I'm showing up here. From this definition, we can then in principle deduce its action on arbitrary states, and we've exemplified this with the momentum eigenstates, getting this result up here. What I want to do now is to look at the general case of an arbitrary state, psi. The first step is to expand it in the position representation. As usual, the expansion coefficients, psi of r, are given by the bracket r psi. And remember that these psi of r are what we call the wave function of the system. Now let's consider the state that we obtain by acting with the parity operator on psi. Expanding psi in the position basis, as we just did, we can then move pi inside the integral, and we get this. Using the action of the parity operator on the position basis states, we end up with this. At this point, it is convenient to see what this new state, pi psi, looks like in the position representation. To do so, we can insert this expression we just obtained in here, and we get this. We can now move the bra here, and we end up with this. The position basis is orthonormal, so we get psi of minus r. So what does this mean? If we start with the wave function psi of r, and we apply the parity operator, then we end up with the wave function psi of minus r. This means that the parity operator reflects the wave function about the origin. We could of course follow the same procedure to find that if we start with the momentum wave function, and we act with the parity operator on it, then we obtain the momentum wave function at minus p. In conclusion, for a general state psi, we can deduce the action of the parity operator by simply calculating the wave function of the state and then reflecting it about the origin. Now that we've defined the parity operator and figured out how it acts on general states through its actional wave functions, the next step is to look at some of its fundamental properties. The first is that it is involutory. This means that it is equal to its inverse. To see this, consider the action of the parity operator squared on an arbitrary position eigenstate. We can expand pi squared like this. The definition of the parity operator gives the state minus r here, and we get this. Applying the definition of the parity operator again, we end up with the state r. Comparing the initial expression with the final one, we see that pi squared is equal to the identity operator. And this confirms that the parity operator is its own inverse. We could actually have guessed this property by just remembering that the parity operator describes spatial inversion. If we reflect r about the origin of the coordinate system, and then reflect it again, we get back where we started. The second property of the parity operator is that it is Hermitian, which means that it is equal to its adjoint. To see this, consider first the defining equation of the parity operator. Next, we build the corresponding expression in the dual space, remembering that to do so we need to turn all keds into bras and all operators into their adjoints. Let's now calculate the matrix element of the parity operator between two position eigenstates r prime and r. We can use this expression in state space to rewrite this one here, and we get the bracket r prime minus r. As the position basis is orthonormal, this gives delta r prime minus minus r, which simplifies to delta r prime plus r. We can now calculate the corresponding matrix element for the adjoint of the parity operator. Using the expression in the dual space here, we can rewrite this one here, and we get the bracket minus r prime r. This again gives a delta function, and as the delta function is an even function, it is equal to this. Comparing these two expressions, we see that the matrix elements between any pair of position basis states are equal, implying that pi is equal to pi dagger, confirming that the parity operator is Hermitian. The next property is that the parity operator is unitary, 
which means that its inverse is equal to its adjoint. This follows trivially from the fact that the parity operator is both involuntary and Hermitian. I now want to look at the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the parity operator. Let's start by writing down the eigenvalue equation, where this here is the eigenvalue and this here is the associated eigenstate. To figure out what these are, let's start by writing down the eigenstate. We can trivially write this as the identity operator acting on lambda. Using the fact that pi squared is equal to the identity, we get this. We can now reorganize this expression. Using the eigenvalue equation here, we get lambda pi lambda. And using the eigenvalue equation here again, we get lambda squared lambda. Comparing the initial expression with the final one, we see that lambda squared equals 1, which in turn means that lambda is equal to plus or minus 1. Before we proceed, we could actually have guessed this result from the fact that the parity operator is Hermitian and unitary. This is because the eigenvalues of a unitary operator are numbers of magnitude 1, and the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real numbers, which combined only leaves plus 1 and minus 1 as the possible eigenvalues of an operator that is both Hermitian and unitary. Moving forward, for the eigenvalue plus 1, we'll label the corresponding eigenstate with psi plus, and we call such an state an even state. Similarly, for the eigenvalue minus 1, we'll label the corresponding eigenstate with psi minus, and we'll call it an odd state. Using these definitions, the eigenvalue equation of the parity operator becomes this. More generally, we will say that even and odd states are states of definite parity. You'll immediately see that the position and momentum eigenstates that we used to define the parity operator do not satisfy the eigenvalue equation, so they aren't parity eigenstates. However, parity eigenstates feature in many quantum systems. Examples include the energy eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator or of the hydrogen atom. To understand why parity eigenstates are so common, you should check out the video on even and odd operators. We showed earlier that a very powerful way of determining the action of the parity operator on a general state was to study the action on the wave functions associated with that state. So we'll now investigate what even and odd states look like in terms of wave functions. Let's consider the defining equation of an even state. If we project this state onto the position basis to obtain the corresponding wave functions, we get this. We showed earlier that the parity operator leads to a wave function reflected about the origin, and it is simply the wave function psi plus of r. Putting this together, we see that even eigenstates are represented by even wave functions. Similarly, we can consider an odd state. Projecting onto the position basis gives this. This is psi minus of minus r, and this is psi minus of r, showing that for odd eigenstates, we have odd wave functions. The final idea I want to discuss in this video is that we can write any arbitrary state as a combination of an even and an odd state. Before we can see that though, we first need to introduce two projection operators. We call the first p plus, and it is equal to one half times the identity operator plus the parity operator. And the second one is p minus, and it is equal to one half times the identity operator minus the parity operator. Remember from the video on projection operators that their defining property is that they are idempotent, which means that they are equal to their square. That means that to demonstrate that p plus and p minus are indeed projection operators, we need to calculate their square. So let's start with p plus squared. Spelling out the definition of p plus, we get this. We can then carry out the multiplication to get these four terms. We know that the square of the parity operator equals the identity, so we simply get this. As expected, this is p plus. This confirms that p plus is a projection operator. Following a similar strategy, we would find that p minus is also idempotent, so it is also a projection operator. Okay, now we know that p plus and p minus are projection operators. The next thing is to check that they project to orthogonal subspaces. To do this, we consider the product p plus p minus. Inserting their definitions, we get this. Multiplying through, we again get four terms. This is again equal to the identity, so we end up with zero. 
This confirms that the two operators project onto orthogonal subspaces. And the final feature of the projection operators we need is that they project onto complementary subspaces, which remember means that their projections span the full state space. To see this, consider the sum of p plus and p minus. Inserting their definitions yet again, we get this. And combining them, we obtain the identity, confirming that they project onto complementary subspaces. We can now use these two projection operators to see how we can write any state psi as the sum of two states, one even and one odd. This relies on realizing that these projection operators project onto eigenstates of the parity operator. To see this, consider the projection p plus on an arbitrary state psi. Acting with pi on this state, we can expand the projection operator in terms of the parity operator. Multiplying through, we obtain this. We know that pi squared equals the identity, and we get this. This here is now the definition of p plus, so we get p plus psi. This shows that acting with the parity operator on the state p plus psi gives the state p plus psi again. This means that p plus psi is an eigenstate of the parity operator with eigenvalue plus one, so we can write it as psi plus because it is an even state. We can repeat the same exercise with the state obtained by acting with the projector p minus on psi. Acting with the piety operator on this state, we would find that it gives minus the same state. This means that p minus psi is an eigenstate of the piety operator with eigenvalue minus one, so we can write it as psi minus because it is an odd state. Overall, and as anticipated, this shows that the projection operator p plus acting on an arbitrary state generates a new state that is even, and the projection operator p minus acting on an arbitrary state generates a new state that is odd. The final step is to show that we can write an arbitrary state psi as a sum over psi plus and psi minus. To do that, we can trivially insert the identity here. We just show that we can expand the identity as the sum over the two projection operators. Multiplying through gives this. And this is simply psi plus, this is psi minus, so we can write an arbitrary state psi as the sum of two states, one even and one odd. At this point, this result may appear like a curiosity, but in reality it is very useful because even and odd states are related to something called selection rules. You can find all the details in the corresponding video linked in the description, but in short, what this means is that the matrix elements of certain operators calculated between even and odd states vanish which is an extremely helpful result that simplifies the maths in many problems. For example, when we study optical absorption. To recap, the parity operator is defined by its action on the position eigenstates, reflecting them about the origin. It then follows that its action on the momentum eigenstates is analogous. In terms of wave functions, the application of the parity operator turns psi of r into psi of minus r. The key properties of the parity operator are that first, it's involutory, second, it's Hermitian, and third, from the first two, it follows that it's unitary. The eigenvalues of the parity operator are plus one, with the corresponding eigenstates called even, or minus one, with the corresponding eigenstates called odd. Finally, we have also found that we can always write an arbitrary state psi as a superposition of an even and an odd state. We're now familiar with the parity operator and how it acts on quantum states. Although today's description has been rather abstract, the ideas we've discussed, such as even and odd states, play a key role in many quantum problems. And the action of the parity operator on quantum states is just part of the story. Don't forget to check the video on even and odd operators, where we discuss the interplay between the parity operator and general operators. And as always, if you like the video, please subscribe.